Thank you for joining us for this edition of the Intelligence Download. It's not the movie Entrapment with Sean Connery, nor is it Ocean's 12 or 13. Today we're talking about art and antiquities, vehicles for money laundering and sanctions evasion, today's government and the industry response. But before we dive in, here's a little bit about our guest. David Chinkin is the managing partner of law firm Zeichner, Elman, and Kraus, and a certified anti-money laundering specialist. Chenkin represents major financial institutions and individuals in civil, criminal, regulatory, and compliance-related investigations initiated by Congress and federal, state, and local prosecutors and regulators. Rob Goldfinger is a global financial crimes expert for BA Systems Applied Intelligence. He's responsible for providing financial crimes and compliance subject matter expertise and providing strategic guidance for customers of BA Systems Applied Intelligence. With nearly three decades of leadership experience in the public and private sectors, he brings a unique combination of management expertise, operational and investigation leadership across business environments that require technology and investigative solutions. So, Rob, we'll kick it over to you. Thank you, Brad. <clears throat> the dealing in art and antiquities to avoid sanctions and facilitate money laundering has recently become a top priority for government officials and regulatory authorities in, in Europe and in the United States. Uh, this is evidenced in, the January, in January of 2020, the EU's fifth money laundering directive further strengthened the EU's money laundering and combating financing of terrorism regime in many ways, including increasing transparency regarding beneficial ownership, enhancing cooperation and information sharing between financial supervisory authorities, <clears throat> introducing stricter controls of tr transactions with customers located in high-risk countries, restricting anonymous use of virtual currencies and allowing for better identification of politically exposed persons, PEPs, and most importantly, extending the scope of sectors and firms subject to anti-money laundering obligations. This new scope now concentrates on arts and antiquities commerce. In relation, in August of 2020, the United States Senate Permanent Subcommittee of Investigations released a report pertaining to the same area. The backbone of concentration was the investigation of two sanctioned Russian oligarchs, Arkaday and Boris Rottenberg. They were initially sanctioned for the invasion of Ukraine in 2014. Subsequent investigations found them involved in art commerce. This investigation by the Senate committee has launched an intensive focus on enhancing the regulations, oversight, and control of the art world as it relates to money laundering, financial crimes, and sanction enforcement. David, can you please provide some insight on these two regional actions by, authority, by the authorities and begin to dive into the subject areas and the effect on financial institutions and other related anti-money laundering efforts? Sure. Thanks, Rob. And hi, everybody. Thanks for having me. Um, as Rob mentioned, the um, U.S. Senate Permanent Subcommittee on, on Investigations uh, issued a report in um, July of, uh, of this year, 2020, relating to sanctions evasion and money laundering in the, in the high-end art industry. Uh, that report was the culmination of, of a, about a two-year investigation by the Senate Permanent Subcommittee. Their, uh, that particular committee of the U.S. Senate is well known for conducting investigations and issuing reports and also having hearings into all sorts of issues relating to the financial crime world dating back you know to to the you know pre 9 11 um, and they've really been responsible for raising awareness on a lot of issues such as beneficial ownership and and sanctions evasion kleptocracy so just to put into context which uh which Senate committee w was doing that. This is the, the famous PSI, as we call it. Um, about a two-year investigation in how, uh, it to be in this case, some Russian oligarchs, but it could be anybody, 
any any type of criminal in the world uh, has used the high end art industry to to not only launder money but to evade U.S. sanctions. The investigation, just two seconds of background, it focused on a couple of major auction houses, some private New York based art dealers, and seven banks. So it encompassed the uh, the art dealers, the auction houses for the art sales, and also the financial institutions that had records of funds transfers used to uh, in the buying and selling of the of the art and the antiquities. One of the highlights, or maybe not a highlight, it could be a low light, uh, but one of the key findings was that uh, folks were able to evade U.S. sanctions and actually purchased. Uh, millions and millions of dollars of art and, and other items after they were sanctioned uh, by using intermediaries. So keep that in mind as the key. Well, like, why are we talking about this and, and why couldn't this have been found? Um, you really have to go back and take a look at the art industry. And although I'm not uh, traditionally an expert in the art industry, I've, I've, I've become well aware of it through this investigation. Um, and uh, the key word is secrecy. So in all of the things that we talk about regarding money laundering and, and financial crime, secrecy is obviously the key because everybody wants to avoid detection. That's why folks launder money. And and the art industry appears to be uh, set up well to do that because secrecy is pervasive in buying and selling high-end art. We're talking about high-end art for millions of dollars. It's not really regulated by anything, so it's certainly not regulated in the U.S. by the Bank Secrecy Act. It's not regulated until very recently, or it wasn't, in, in the EU, the U.K., uh, by the money laundering directives, and we're going to talk about that in a minute. Rob Rob mentioned it. Uh, it's also, you know, it's it's this mysterious type of industry that's governed by by really unwritten rules that the folks who participate in it, know about, uh, but I didn't. I guess most people don't. And here's the key. Most of the sales, at least this is, again, what the what the PSI found. I'm not an, an independent expert in it. But most of the purchases and sales happen through intermediaries. So I wouldn't go to Rob and say, I have a Rembrandt or a Renoir or something to sell. Um, or he wouldn't come to me and ask him to buy one of mine. But we would go through intermediaries and and usually as i take it or as i understand it usually the, the purchasers and sellers don't even know who each other are because it's all done through these art advisors or, or intermediaries so uh, that that kind of lays the ground sure go ahead Rob. Uh, david so it sounds to me like with your introduction it, it just sounds like uh, what's old is new again that this is a, a just another industry that uh, has remained generally un, unregulated uh, th in different geographies, and now it seems to be percolating to the top as a result of uh, these individuals that were sanctioned uh, be, being involved in it. Uh, would, that, would that be correct? Yeah, totally. Uh, the, the beauty of having been in the industry uh, for as long as we have is not just that we're old guys. <laughs> Uh, but that it, you really do see that, that as you say, everything old is, is new again. So folks out there who are listening to this, or if you go and read the report or, or listen to kind of the rest of what we're going to be talking about here in a couple of minutes, now how does this happen? It happens the same way that most other types of money laundering or evasion or trade-based money laundering happen. What we're talking about are shell companies. Uh, non-transparent beneficial owners, so you have intermediaries acting, say, for you or for, for me, and and uh, the auction houses and, and, and other folks don't know that it's you and me. They just, they're dealing with our intermediaries. Like, does that sound familiar? Uh, it sounds like what we've been talking about for the last 50 years in this industry. Um, persons using the path of least resistance. So Rob is a former chief in law enforcement. You understand better than I do, that criminals are very adaptive and they'll use the path of least resistance. They, you know, when the large financial institutions are perceived as having um, locked down uh, anti-money laundering programs, uh, it's much easier or perhaps safer, or at least it appears so, 
to go to smaller banks and smaller institutions, credit unions and things like that, uh, that may not have as robust a program. And in this, in this situation, it's, it's perceived as the path of least resistance to, to launder the funds or evade the sanctions through the trade-based money laundering art because the art houses and the art dealers uh, really, at least until recently in the US, EU and not at all in the United States, they don't have a uh, money laundering reporting or program obligation. So everything old is new again. It's the same. You could apply the. It's the same paradigm. It's just applied in a different context in a you know in a different industry. Um, so, the su- so the subject in the area US, is that. So the subject area is that then would need to be addressed as we, as as there is a global effort to the, combat this, it's almost like it's the, the traditional uh, items or verticals that we look at, uh, beneficial ownership, KYC, uh, people or entities uh, that are linked, uh, aggressive tracking of people that may be on sanctions lists. It, absolutely. And the, you know, the interesting thing is that the, if, if you take a look at what the report found, found that the that the the four biggest auction houses who do who perform the art auctions in the U.S. Um, the four biggest one have in, in implemented voluntary uh, AML or anti money laundering programs. So you would say, well, that's great, but what's the catch? Then to your point, you know, the catch is that number one. They view the intermediaries as quote unquote the customer. So, uh, e- even if, you know, even if they, it's illusory in my mind, because if they're, if they're looking at the intermediaries as the customer, that means nothing. Uh, so, you know, that's number one. And number two, they rely on, uh, or at least this is what they claimed when they were interviewed for the report. They rely on the financial institutions essentially to vet one of a better term and identify the sources of the funds that he used to purchase the oil. So in my sense, and this may have changed since they were interviewed for the report. And again, I wasn't there, so I'm not trying to impugn the art industry or auction houses. But the fact is, if you, if you have an AML program and you are um, looking at the wrong person, it's, you know, it's similar to, again, you, the U S banks, before the beneficial ownership requirements came in, uh, you could do all the, the vetting you want and get all the KC you, KYC you want on, you know, X Corp. But if you don't really know who owns X Corp or who's the beneficial owner of X Corp, it's really useless because you don't, you don't really know where the money is coming from or going. David, in, re- in reflection to what you just said in terms of the uh, c- compliance procedures or process, uh, what, what it, from from your inv- in, involvement, how do you see this is going to uh, be facilitated? I mean, are the are the elements of the art industry going to be expected to set up uh, compliance process and regimes? Are they going to be have compliance officers, or is that going to remain with the to keep their information updated with the financial institutions uh, that they that they do business with, uh, are they going to have uh, attorneys on staff that are going to help them uh, in compliance with whatever comes as a result of this United States Senate action or of the Fifth Directive? H- how do you envision this uh, happening as it directly replies uh, or applies to uh, to the industry? I think that, you know, if you, if you want to read the tea leaves, I think, you, you know, one of the things that you have to look at is the, is the, you know, the fifth, uh, the, the EU fifth, uh, MLD. And, and so let's take a look at that for a second. So what in, in the EU, the M- MLD five basically, uh, now includes persons trading or acting as intermediary in, in, in they call it trade of works of art. Um, and and they they put a dollar limit on it or a dollar threshold on it uh, for uh, ten thousand euros. So if you're if you're going to be conducting transactions in art valued at ten thousand euros or more, and that includes a series of transactions that would add up to that, 
then essentially you're you are considered for one of a better term under the EU directive as as a financial institution that's covered and ha you have to have a, an AML program you have to have a you know you have to do a risk assessment and and, and all those things essentially what the Senate permanent subcommittee was doing or recommending is that the U.S. do the same thing. So what the Senate report recommended, it came out with a group of, I don't know, like seven or eight recommendations, a couple, you know, a number of which are relevant right here. One of the things that they recommended, and I will tell you it's the, it's the reason that they issued the report, frankly, is that the United States Treasury amend the Bank Secrecy Act to include Auction, auction houses and art dealers, uh, any types, any types of business that would transact in high value art, to include that as quote unquote a financial institution under the BSA that would have the same obligations as as banks um, and and others for having an AML program. And so my sense is that uh, I, I don't know how. <laughs> You know, I don't know how strong the lobby for the auction houses might be, which is usually where you get the opposition to these types of things or or something else. But my sense is that it's probably just a matter of time before uh, the U.S. amends the BSA to include auction houses, art dealers. There may be some restrictions on it. There may be some, you know, uh, levels on it. But uh, but my sense is it's going to happen similar to the to the EU fifth money laundering directive. I don't know how how long it's going to take. And I'll tell you the easy part. The easy part is the big auction houses are doing it already, as we discussed before, Rob. You know, my sense again, they may have changed it, and I don't know their business. I'm not trying to impugn anyone, but the fact that you could have a very robust AML program with compliance officers, which they do. And attorneys, which they do. But if you're going to be focusing, if you're going to consider your client or your customer as the as only the intermediary and solely rely on the financial institutions to uh, to vet the, the sources of funds that are going to be used to purchase this, then that's a really big gap and it's a really big hole in it. So I think that if they haven't already fixed that, you know, they're going to have to. And I, I change that. And I think it's going to usher in just a whole new era in the way that industry operates with its with its secrecy. Look, we had the same thing in the banking industry, and I'm to a certain extent still do today. But the, the whole beneficial ownership or lack thereof is a is a topic that we've been, you know, talking about since, you know, way pre 9-11. And certainly is one that the that former iterations of the Senate PSI have addressed in, in many hearings and reports over the years. Something else that's interesting is that in, in addition to the recommendation that the U.S. amend the Bank Secrecy Act to include art dealers and, and, and auction houses, is there the couple of things that they, that they recommended regarding sanctions, which I thought would just be interesting to mention. One of the things that happened here was the, the U.S. Treasury, uh, OFAC, uh, announced that certain individuals, including like the two here that you mentioned, uh, were going to be sanctions, but the actual sanction, but the actual sanctions did not take place until a couple of days after. I forget uh, the exact timing. So uh, those folks were able to conduct a number of transactions in millions of dollars. Between the time that it was announced that they were going to be sanctions and the time that the sanctions actually went into place. So one of the things that the report recommends is that Treasury here announce and actually implement sanctions on anybody uh, concurrently. So it, it closes that window. Um, another thing that they that they mentioned is that uh, that OFAC here in the U.S., uh, raise sanctions should issue comprehensive guidance for auction houses and art dealers uh, regarding steps to determine whether a person is a, is is the real principal or just a, a, an intermediary acting on uh, you know on behalf of an undisclosed client and then which which one, you know which one of those obviously the undisclosed client should you conduct a CDD on or customer due diligence so 
it, it's all leading there. I can't tell you how long it's going to take. My sense is that the in the in the two years since the PSI started this their investigation or so, my my guess is that uh, at least the large auction houses have changed the way that they do business and and the way they they do the vetting and that type of stuff. That's my so, that's my I just it's my sense. It certainly will happen, David. So it sounds like right now we are in a a point of pivot, uh, that a, a real transition is is going to take place in terms of this art and antiquities uh, commerce. So, some of it has been voluntary, as you mentioned, and it looks like the voluntary component is going to be ramping up. But it also looks like with the seriousness uh, from the EU and from the United States that some mandates are going to take place. And quite obviously, when voluntary efforts and mandates take place, it, it brings us to how are the different elements of our uh, over, oversight portions of our community uh, that are in the long-term fight on this, how are they going to uh, be partnering how are they going to communicate? How are they going to collaborate so that these voluntary and mandated actions actually have some meaning and some muscle? So with that, what do you see as um, uh, some of the things that uh, financial institutions might see themselves uh, involved in um, as a result of this uh, new pressure on, on the art uh, community? Yeah, that's a that's an interesting question. The um, and let's in, let's include in financial institutions, although it's kind of a misnomer, but under the Bank Secrecy Act, if you are you know designated as an FI, as we call them, financial institution, let's include the art industry in that art, auction houses and art dealers, because if they're if they do become included, then technically they're considered financial institutions that are subject to it. So, I, I mean, I look at it like this. It's, I, I think it's pretty simple. The um, Now that, I'm going to say now that we know, it's not that people didn't know this before, and it's not that, that some financial institutions weren't already looking at art dealings and, and art houses and, and auctions as uh, potentially a higher risk you know, type of business. I mean, people knew, people knew this. This isn't something that just fell out of the sky. However, I think that absolutely, to the extent that people, that, that that traditional financial institutions, banks, were really focusing on the risk involved in the high-end art uh, area and the high-end art industry, now that they are. I mean, this report is, you know, was... Uh, wasn't necessarily a bombshell, but it was it was important, and and everybody noticed it. So to the extent that that they weren't doing it before, I guarantee you that financial institutions, after this report came out, uh, like with everything else, like when the Panama Papers came out, which actually played an interesting role in in, in this report and the discovery of who these folks were, but like with everything else, you know, something comes up and you go back. And it's prudent to go back and say, well. You know, let you know. Are we banking auction houses? Are we banking art dealers? What has their activity been? We will look back. Maybe we consider how we classify them in terms of a, a risk rating. Um, combining that with potentially countries where they're operating from. Do they have, uh, you know, offices in, in in you know in the U.S. and do they have offices in in other high risk jurisdictions? I guess the U.S. is considered high risk. Uh, you know, Russia and places like that. Um, and everything that, everything that, that banks would traditionally do when it arises that there's this awareness of, uh, a, a, a client group or a client sector that poses potentially higher risk than they be viewed as before. I think all of that is happening now. I'm not suggesting it wasn't happening before in a lot of institutions. It was. It's certainly going to be happening in the art industry. Um, I'm, I am assuming it's happening already, and I know that it's happening in the traditional bank uh, financial, in, you know, financial industry. So if we had to take a look at some of the, um, as we wrap up here, some of the immediate takeaways, um, 
it's going to appear from at least the bank standpoint is they're really going to have to ramp up when they when they find out or have an obligation to find out it, two things if any of their customers are involved in 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 the art commerce and once that is <clears throat> determined to be able to take more aggressive steps in terms of the uh, the EDD, the enhanced due diligence portions of their their know your customer program. So, for example, to if a transaction takes place from one of these entities, that they really have to take a deeper look in terms of what kind of transaction that is, how frequent would it, it frequently is this happening? Are there any uh, key outliers in terms of the the level of funds that are being used, what geographic locations are they coming from, and then other people that might be linked to that account. Um, I'm also thinking that um, uh, quite obviously this may even change the uh, their process or procedures in the aggressiveness of the filing of SARS in this area. Uh, Dave, David, what else would you have to add to some final takeaways uh, pertaining to what financial institutions and other people in the industry might be doing in reflection and response to this new attention from the uh, the Senate's action and from the Fifth Directive. Yeah, and listen, although it's it's not maybe a uh, it's it's not maybe completely uh, a hundred percent great analogy, but just for to simplification purposes. Analogize it to correspondent banking. Uh, yes. So, you know, we always say that we're not, banks aren't responsible for knowing your customer's customer. Uh, and in the correspondent banking world, uh, that's a fuzzy line because there are transactional activity that the, that banks monitor uh, of the customer's customer. But let's just take a look at it. So if I'm a bank right now uh, and I you know, I have a respondent bank that, that I'm bringing on. I'm doing a lot of enhanced due diligence on that respondent bank. I want to know about that bank's own anti-money laundering program um, through the, you know, through the Wolfsburg questionnaire, et cetera, et cetera. So let's equate that to uh, auction houses and art dealers. So if I'm a bank and let's say auction houses and art dealers are, are required at some point in the U.S. to have their own AML program. Certainly, the first question that I'm going to ask if I have one of those as a client is, "Let like, I want to do due diligence on your on your AML program." I think the same way I would want to do it on a respondent bank that's coming to me to be their correspondent bank. Um, I I guarantee you, Rob. Although I don't I don't know for sure, but I do represent a number of banks. I guarantee you that after this re report broke, and perhaps even before. Um, financial institutions here in the United States, at least, who have customers who are large auction houses or large art, de art dealers, um, have have gone back to 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 ask those folks what the heck they're doing to 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 guard against this stuff and what their program, if they have a voluntary program, what it entails and what it's all about. So just so the banks are knowledgeable about that, and I really think that that's where we're going if if not gone already, in addition to whatever else the bank is going to do on a risk rating for uh, a financial house. And also, I, I, I suspect there will be a lot of transactions or there will be transactions that banks will want to go back and, and ask their customers about um, particular transactions. In terms of filing SARS, you know, their obligation to file SARS has not changed, but I'll finish with this. I, I would think that Potentially, you know, because of this awareness that it might be that um, it's an additional factor in considering when you're looking at transactional activity to try to determine whether it's suspicious or not. The fact that it's now viewed as, as an auction house or an art dealer might lend some color to inform a decision or, or whatever in terms of reporting it and also how you report it. So that's my sense. Yes, and it, David, in, in context of the comments that you made, uh, the it, it kind of spells out to me that, um, as you've mentioned, while this is not 
an activity that has been has been looked at, the behaviors are very much the same as some of the other uh, uh, problems and concerns that um, uh, people in the industry have been addressing for decades. One thing that is qu it's quite apparent is that uh, financial institutions uh, from the, the, the top uh, financial crimes executives already all the way down to the people that are the, the, the analysts and the KYC onboarding people that it would appear to me they're really going to have to embark on uh, an education uh, in terms of some of the uh, activities on how many of the many of the things that you mentioned today, how some of these uh, I'll put it in quotes corrupt practices are are taking place, so that it can then go flow into all of the KYC and the FIU and the behavioral analysis and the transaction monitoring. Uh, rules so that um, these types of behaviors can be identified and tracked and followed up on. Uh, David, any other uh, concluding um, remarks that you would like to give before we wrap up here today? Yeah, just 30 seconds to follow your point. If, if folks out there actually read the report, it's not that long, um, and you could skip over parts you're not interested in. But they'll see a perfect example of, of, of some banks, including one particular bank that was mentioned in the report, that got it right. Uh, so they, they talk about a, a particular bank. It happens to be Barclays. It's public. It's in the report. Uh, and they really show how um, some wonderful investigators there uh, un uncovered the situation here that they're reporting on. Uh, and I think that what the PSI essentially was trying to do is to juxtapose the fact that you had a, a, a bank that was subject to the BSA uh, here in the U.S. that um, that did the right thing and uh, an exemplary thing. And I think they were trying to juxtapose that to the art industry, which at the time, at least in the United States, did not did not have that obligation. So you talk about things that financial institutions can do and the clues and, and how the investigators there followed the clues, which started with the Panama Papers, as I mentioned before. And, and that'll give you a good sense about how one financial institution that was highlighted in the report actually got it right. So it's, it's just an interesting case study for folks out there, both on the bank side and, and on the art industry side. In, into how to get it right. Well, David and Rob, greatly appreciate you both kind of painting the picture, so to speak, on all of this. And uh, thank you so much for listening to this version of the Intelligence Download. We post uh, podcasts every couple of weeks, and you can find them wherever you download your podcasts. And thank you again. Mm -hmm.